Terry, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. Okay. All right. So we're live now. We are live now. Hi, guys. Everyone watching. Thanks for joining us today. Um, okay. All right, so hi guys, welcome to Skill Bees. Um, I'm Terry. It's, um, it's a pleasure to have you all here today. Um, so for those of you that may not know, Skill Bees is a strategy and entrepreneurship um, training initi initiative by Piggyvest, intended to teach applicants the skills required to start and grow a business successfully. So um, today's topic is starting a successful business from scratch. Um, let me introduce you to our, um, our speaker today. We have um, Olakuke Balogun, founder and CEO of SoFresh. Hi, Guke. Nice to be here. Okay, uh, we have um, Bumi George, founder of Shredder Gang. Hi, Bumi. Hi, thank you so much. And, thanks. And um, celebrity photographer, Annie Roberts. Hi, Annie. Hi, 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 Terry. That's great. Um, so for those of you watching live, you can send in questions um, um, right here on Zoom um, and we'll get to them at the end of the session. Okay, so um, um, we'll be using a Q&A format today. Um, I'll be asking our speakers five questions each. Um, I'll start to go okay. So, um, Hi, okay, tell us um, what happened between when you first had the idea for SoFresh to when you first opened for business. Right, thank you, Terry. Um, and everyone, thanks for having me. Um, so when, when I got the idea for, for the business, uh, the first thing I did was you know, to do some kind of research. Um, because remember at that time, 2010, the basic idea was to retail fruits and vegetables in an organized environment, you know, like, like, what you, in, like a supermarket. And I'd not seen anything done like that. I did not understand how to preserve fruits for a long time and all of that. So the first thing I did was to actually research about the business. What does it entail? I remember making, you know, several visits to ShopRite then trying to speak to their guys at the fruit section, how they preserve their fruits, how they did their supplies and, you know, I actually did that for, for about six months. Uh, I was going to K to my 12. I was going to this um, this market in Ijora. You know, then I was going to um, Lagos Island uh, market just to understand mm -hmm. how, how how that you know how that sector was and all of that. Then apart from doing the, those physical research, I was also doing a lot of market research. Um, what were people buying? And, and all of that. So, you know, research was very key. Um, the next thing I did was to actually recruit a partner. So when I thought, okay, this business idea looked like it made sense. So I told my wife, you know, I tried to paint the, the idea of the business to her. Okay. And, you know, luckily for me, she loved the idea. And then together, you know, from then we started, you know, thinking about it together. And then once we both agreed that it was a viable business, um, I'm a stickler for planning. So the next thing I did was to create a, a business plan. And, you know, interestingly, like, um, like, like four weeks ago during this lockdown, I was trying to arrange my, my place. And then I saw the business plan I put down 10 years ago. It was a very simple business plan. It was just you know, about, you know, um, what, what was the market? What solution am I bringing? And what people do I want to sell? It was very simple, but, you know, at that beginning, it was very, it was very useful for us. Um, so you know, we, we drew up the business plan, and then of course we re registered the business. Because I'd had a lot of experience working in very organized, you know, environment. I'd worked with VAC, I'd worked with Coca Cola, I'd worked with Chevron. So it was also very important for for me to structure the business early on. So even before we started business, we put in a lot of structures. We had HR policies, we had operational policies, and all of that. 
So, you know, at the point in time, my wife was frustrated, like, how long are we going to plan and structure this thing? Let's start this thing. But, you know, I thought it was important at that early, early stage. So once we did that, um, we started looking for, you know, location um, where we thought we were viable for, for the kind of business you wanted to do. And so, and so that was it. And so, you know, um, we got a location and then, and then we started. I mean, so I'm going to summarize from the day I had the, that idea first to when we started, it was a lot of research, market research, you know, um, business, looking into the business itself, also customer insight to know what kind of customers are we do want to attract. Then I, you know, I enlisted a partner, in this case, my wife. I shared a dream with her. We believed in it together. And then we created a business plan for us to run, to, to, to run with. And then you know, we, we tried to put you know, proper structure in place right from the start, we registered the business. We had a business account for the business. Um, we had basic, simple policies in place. In fact, we had our onboarding and training programs in place before we started. And yeah, so that, that, that was the journey between the idea and the start of phase. Okay, okay, that's great. Um, so Bumi, let's go to you. Uh, so tell us about Shredder Gang and what inspired you to start it. Okay, thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to share my story here. I really appreciate it. So um, for me, I have a personal history of being overweight. Um, I would say obese, right? So from an early age of about 13, I started gaining a lot of weight. Okay. And so um, I struggled with obesity from all of my, all through my teenage years up until, you know, early adulthood. And I remember just telling myself that, you know what, Bumi, you have to take control of your life. I mean, I had tried different diets, right? But being okay. a regular girl through and through, I still mm -hmm. like regular stew, efori roll, egusi, all that kind of stuff, right? And mm -hmm. I for me, I just couldn't let that go. So imagine going, and I was living abroad at, at, at the time. So imagine going, you know, your family eating something and you're eating something else and going months on a diet and not eating any of your regular Nigerian food. It just didn't cut it for me. So um, I decided to now prepare my own type of meal plan with my Nigerian food, learn to make Nigerian food in a healthier way. And I did that. Now I then lost 55 kg in 14 months, which was really crazy, outrageous, right? People then begin to, began to see my transition from being a size 22 down to a size 14. And everyone was like, oh my gosh, Bumi, like, I mean, we saw this entire process. Like, what did you do? You know, I had my mom's friends calling me saying, telling my mom, Bumi have to help me. Ah, this is my stomach. I need to lose weight, right? So a lot of people were calling me here and there. Um, congratulations on your weight loss, you know. And at that point, social media was just, you know, picking up. So this was in 2011. And um, I, I, I had posted my before and after picture. And everybody was like, because everyone has known me. I mean, for as long as people had known me, I had been overweight. I mean, except you have known me before I was 10 years old, right? So you, you see a lady who was you know a size 22 and now you know basically a size 14 and so i then started helping people out and um the first couple of people were for free to be very honest but people kept calling me after one month i would drop new plans for them they'll call me the next month i've lost seven kg i need another one i need to continue right and so after like helping a couple of people for like maybe three months i think i presume it was about three months i thought to myself i have to start charging a fee for this and so that was the metamorphosis of Shredder Gang. Shredder Gang came out of my own need that other people had as well. And so I didn't actually start out to make Shredder Gang a business. I always say that Shredder Gang happened to me. So I was just helping people out with something that helped me. And then it translated into a business. Or I decided to see it as something that could translate into a business. Because at this point, I couldn't say that there was anybody else that was doing this in this space at all. So that was yeah. how Shredder Gang started. And so I then was living in Toronto at the time. I moved to Nigeria um, because I felt that, you know, I had a better chance at making this an empire. Um, because of course, these are my targets. My target market was Nigerians. 
So I moved from Toronto to, Ni to Lagos and um, started. I don't know if you want me to keep going, expatiating on. on um, we have, um, we have um, um, more questions for you going okay. forward because you've raised some very important points here. Um, so there was a need first before you even thought about um, uh, making money off it. So that is a very important, uh, a very important lesson most aspiring entrepreneurs need to learn. So, um, um, so you guys watching live, um, just to remind you that you can use the Q&A feature here on Zoom and ask your questions to, to any of the speakers. So, um, um, Annie, let's go to you. So, um, you know, you're well known for your photography, but uh, I want to know when did you start and um, how did you build your skill sets? Um, well, thanks, Terry, and thanks, Piggy Bank, for this. Um, I started um, around 2014, uh, where I met you know a couple of photographer friends, and really I stumbled on I stumbled on this. Um, really, I didn't um, envision I'll be a photographer at at that time or any point in time in my life. Uh, I was a graphic designer then, so. Um, that was how, what I was doing, but I had a couple of people that around me that were doing photography, and um, basically I just saw what they were, uh, what they did, how much they earned, and all that. And it was that did, my my own um, entry into the business wasn't from you know um, feeling a need or you know that kind of thing. It wasn't I don't think it's anything aspirational. It was clearly from a point of where I saw that. You know, these people made way more money than me, you know, and I feel it's something I could do, you know. So that was that was the angle I came from. The place that kick started me off um, photography was when I saw someone, my friends a lot. Mm -hmm. I, I can vividly remember it popping up on her phone and I'm like, do you, you make this kind of money? But I, because I already had a background in Photoshop, and that is a, a key software for photography. So I'm like, you know what, why can't I just start learning, you know, the post-production and all that bit, and I'll pick it up from there. So it was like about two years, because photography is quite expensive. You can't just, you can't just up and say you want to be a photographer, and you know, unless you're a rich person, you know, and you get all the tools, fine, that's, that's all well and good, but it, it's a couple of millions for you to gear up, you know, to start photography. So I started with one I know. I started with one I had, and that's to build my skill set for post production, which was all I needed was which was all I needed was all I had by that time. A, a computer, software, and and that's how I started. I started building that for about two years, you know, learning the groundwork of post production, you know, get pictures from you know my friends, get pictures from different people. And work on them, and I, you know, post them on social media. I told two people on social media that you know I'm going to try this bit. So that's that's where it it kicked off from, and I'm sure it's it's it kicked off from like that for a lot of people. But I found out that you know I was actually talented in this. It was just you know it was just something that I I just you know oh I'm actually good at this. So I think it's kind of I was just kind of lucky to you know, hit something that, you know, I was good in and could also, you know, bring me profit. And and that's when it kicked off. I kicked off professionally 2016, 2016 um, January. I already wanted to kick off, you know, way back before that. But, you know, I, bought, I got loan from my parents, got all my gear and all that. And I thought, you know, things would kick off immediately. But it was a silent, I think, six, seven months before, before you know, my first job started. And, you know, once that started, you know, it never stopped from there. So that's, okay. that's really, you know, that's really where you know, I came from, you know. Okay, okay. That's yeah. good. So um, um, there's still some more questions here. So you guys keep on sending your questions um, to, to any of our speakers here. So, um, okay, let's go back to you. So Fresh has 11 outlets in Nigeria. Am I right? 11. Yes, you're right. Eleven. So you know that's you know that's, those are physical brick and mortar outlets that people can actually go to. That must have required some some in some very um 
um, highbrow areas, you know, so that must have required a lot of capital. Tell us about how you raised funds. Um, okay, uh, so I, I'm going to I'm going to try to start from the beginning. Um, since this is about starting business, uh, yeah. so when we started business, we basically started with our savings. You know, myself and my wife we put together our savings and we opened one outlet, and um, so that was so it was it was basically that. And along the line, as we started to prove the concept. Um, we got a uh, family, you know, basically my mom to loan us, you know, um, some money at the point in time when the business was actually struggling. So it wasn't even for opening the new outlet. It was why the business was struggling. We needed some cash to cushion, you know, and so we got, you know, very soft loan from, from, from my mom. And that was how we started. And we did that for eight years. So it was a lot of bootstrapping, a lot of reinvesting back, You know the little profit we were making at a point in time, but you know much much more of borrowing against our own personal you know finances. So I was working. So uh, at the time I had to be borrowing against my own my own salary, and then uh, sometimes even pouring like more than eighty percent of our savings in, in, into the business. So that that was the starting point for for the business. Um, around about after eight years, when we had proved the concept when we had, you know, shown a lot of financial discipline and accountability, you know, being able to have a skin in the game. Because a lot of the time when investors come, that's the first thing they want to see. Do you have a skin in the game? Um, have you been able to put your own money where your mouth is? Um, do your family and friends trust you enough to give you, even if it's a little amount and all of that? Um, so that was how we did it. And, you know, it, it was quite a very painful and slow process. Because um, um, as of 2018, we had only three outlets. And that was from running it with our own money, with our own profits, and investing it back. And so, you know, about 2017, we knew the business was ready to go to the next level. And so um, we started um, looking for external investment in, in, into the business. And so we're looking for the kinds of, you know, um, investors that partner with us, not just give money but also help with, with the growth of the business. Um, so how this happened was um, in 2017, I went for a course at LB, at um, EDC. And then there, um, it was being funded, the course was being funded by an NGO in, in Netherlands. And so, you know, it was an opportunity to examine the business. When they saw what the business was doing, they saw the growth potentials for the business, they saw how well the business has been managed over the last two years, they became very interested in, in putting in funds. And so we went through all that due diligence for, for about 15 months. And so eventually we got you know, external funding um, sometime in 2018. And you know that, that's what has propelled the business from there. And we went from three outlets to 11. Um, in fact, the, the, the COVID situation has slowed down our growth. We should probably be at, at about 15 or 14 right now. But of course, we know, you know what, what's going on. Uh, so that has been the trajectory of, you know, um, of running the business. I would say for you to attract you know, funding for your business, either through you know, bank loan or through in equity investment, um, the first thing is that you need to understand your market. How big is the market? How sustainable is the business? Can the business go from 10 to 1,000? I didn't go from 1,000 to 10,000 because we must always remember that um, funding, investment, it's, um, it's not charity. They are also in it you know, to make money and to return money to, to their own you know, shareholders as it were. Um, so being able to prove the business, being able to show growth, being able to show um, capacity to actually manage and deliver on that idea. So it's not, for, it's not enough for you to have a brilliant idea. Do you have the team? Do you have the resources? Do you have the capacity to actually deliver on that idea? Um, so these are all the things you know, the, the investors looked at and you know, I, I believe they were satisfied obviously. And then you know, we, we were able to attract those funds in 2018 and it has helped us you know um scale much much faster okay all right thank you very much for good um good case so i can see a theme here the theme here of
proving your worth before looking for even more investments. You know, yeah, um, yeah um, and the theme of of monetizing your own skills and your gifts. So, um, so next we have um, um, Bumi. So Bumi, um, you know, you 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 already told us a bit of um, um, when you decided, okay, see, it's time to start charging these clients. But can you tell us more about how you got your first set of paying clients? I think that that's such a fantastic question. So my first paid clients, um, I had then moved to Nigeria and um, my first paid client was my, uh, in Nigeria, was my sister-in-law. Um, mm. She wanted to lose weight. And so my then boyfriend, who's my husband now, then introduced me to his sister saying, you know, this is what Bumi does, she can help you. So I went to had a meeting with her and the rest is history, we'll see, right? So for me, from her was basically word of mouth. Moving from her was basically now me showing how much value I had to give and sharing my personal story. So what did I do? I went on Instagram and created an Instagram page for Shredder Gang. Um, from here, I started sharing my before and after pictures, my story, um, just sharing every day, giving value. And people started getting attracted to what I was sharing because of course it's nothing like they've ever seen before. Like, Oh my goodness, this person is saying that, um, she lost weight from just eating right and exercising. Right. And then of course I had a lot of before and after pictures I was sharing. I was sharing my, um, my food, food I was eating daily. Of course, so fresh was also one of my go-tos, um, at the beginning of when I was, um, um, starting my starting my my business here in Nigeria, so I'll go to So Fresh. I'll take a picture. I'll be like, I had, I just having my picking up my breakfast from So Fresh. It is kale, mango, this, this, this. And people are like, oh, really? Okay, so I can make this at home as well. And so for me, it was basically just giving value. I got most of my paid clients off Instagram. So first of all, it was word of mouth, and then it moved to social media. So social media played a big role in me getting all my paid clients. So I, I believe in the first month, I got um, three clients. And by the second month, I already had almost 20 off of social media. And then those guys who then got great results now started telling their friends, or well, the thing about this business is that seeing is believing, right? So when you see someone two months ago and you see them now, and you're like, what the hell happened to you? What did you do? And then they say, it's Shredder Gangs, this young lady who is, you know, lost with herself and now is helping other people do the same. Um, people are just calling me up. My, I, was, I was getting very busy. Um, and so that's how I started getting um, my paid clients. And the thing I actually loved about it was the people that were actually serious about losing weight had no issues with pain, right? Because they had seen my own progress, right? So I was the biggest storyteller. Like I, it was my story you could see. And for me, um, because I had a lot of stretch marks, it was like a, it was like a believable story. So there was something to show. So even if I, I was like, let me say this, I was my billboard, right? I was my billboard. If I go into a, a store and some, some way, somehow I start talking to someone, women will always ask me, oh, so your stretch marks, what are you doing about it? And I'll say absolutely nothing. I love them. They are my warrior marks. And then we start having a conversation and then I'm able to then talk about my business to them. Right. So I was my biggest billboard. I mean, there was word of mouth and then social media played a very big role um, in helping me push um, the narrative what I wanted to get out there. This was far back as 2013. Right. So social media wasn't even what it is today into it like six years ago. This is almost seven, seven years ago, seven years ago. It, it's not what it is right now. But with the limited um, uh, things that we had then, I was able to get uh, my paid clients through that. So for me, I would say the three, the three things, I was my biggest billboard sharing my authentic story. Um, two was word of mouth. So people, you know, sharing uh, uh, my services with other people or people seeing it and saying, you know what, I want what you did. And then third, social media. Um, which was basically just amplifying my voice. 
Okay. All right. That's that, that's fantastic. Um, um, so we have marketing via storytelling. You know, that is one of the most effective. I can tell you from my own personal experience, my own personal journey, that is um, one of the most effective marketing tools and that an entrepreneur can have. So, um, so you guys have, have been sending lots of questions. Um, keep them coming. Uh, we'll try and um, rush through them at the end of the session. So, Annie, this one is for you. Um, you know, you, you, you've spoken a little bit about how you got funding for your first set of equipment. But, um, you know, I know I know for a fact that I have friends too that are into photography and, um, you know, one camera, one million naira, and so on and so forth. Like, man, wow. Okay, so they're quite pricey. Tell us how you, you, you raise funds to, to acquire such expensive equipment. Okay, so um, I'm going to say, start by saying well, one thing. It's great. Everybody has um, a great story here, you know. Mm -hmm. um, Olago K had it, you know, his mom that gave him, you know, a soft loan. It is a great thing if your parents believe in you. I'm just going to say that flat out, you know. If it creates mm -hmm. if your parents or your guy there and or somebody, you know, that's a boy who believes in you and is willing to, you know, put their head out for you. So that was that was that was the first part for me. You know, my parents they didn't know much about photography. This is 2015, I'm talking to them. Their idea of photography is, you know, you know, passport type of, you know, somebody just come mm. take black any basically a cake. You know, especially because they live in the north, so it's not it's not something commercial over there. So their own problem wasn't the the idea. Their own problem was I was about to go take loan from a loan shark, and they are they are well very well versed with the loan problem of you know probably he will not know how he will not have the ability to pay back. You know, so that was where you know they came in and helped him like you know what we're going to give you this money just take it and you know pay us back you know of course i couldn't pay them back immediately as i promised you know which was the lesson they now looked at me and told you shit we told you that kind of thing you know so the parents is one the second was um well you know what i'm going to still say it has i mean aside from my own personal savings you know gathering to get uh, money to buy, you know, I think I, I got, I got a, another camera that was for my own friend, but the rest of them, my mom, so my mom, my mom now, you know, took interest in me, you know, and, you know, I borrowed another bit and I, and I paid her back. So I now, what I did was I went to go borrow from a loan facility when I was, I couldn't, I didn't want to disturb her. Um, they took um, four percent off every month, and all that kind of thing. And and I paid them back basically. I, I started paying them back. So I think my mom got um, this huge fund off her pension or whatever. This was some years back, and she was like, you know what? Since you've done this with these people for a year and you've had no problem, nobody's come to arrest you, nothing. You know, do it with me. I'm going to reduce your interest rates to two percent. That way I make money too, you know. So she became my partner, basically, you know, and she partnered up with me and was like, if you need money, I'm here, you know, to make pro profits also, you know. So just ask me anytime. So it's been like three years now, you know. I mean, I always, I don't want to disturb. Every time I'm always thinking, but the thing is, for you to grow, you need money. For you to make the next step, you need money. I'm not going to lie to you. This is, you need money to make money, you know, unless you want to, yeah. the, only, the difference between, you know, taking a loan, but I'm not going to advise everybody, oh, you know, just go take a loan. I have, I have seen what I make, you know, every month, do you understand, for years. So I know, you know, a certain amount of amount I'll take that will be comfortable for me, that kind of thing. And this, this one thing, I, I have been on loans for, I'm still on loans. <laughs> I've been on loans for you know a long amount of years, and this is what this is what I'm going to say. Savings is going to take time, 
before you reach your goal, before you start what you want to do. But loan, if you're serious, it gives you right now, now you're committed to pay back. Just as savings, you have a choice. You might go back, you might touch it, you might use it for something else. You know, you might be lazy, you might say, but loans, you have to pay back. There is no, so it keeps you committed. Now you've bought your camera, now you've bought your whatever, whatever equipment you've gotten. Now you're going to hustle to make sure that at the end of the month, when the date comes, you have to. So by the time you're done with that loan, it's like you've walked towards something. And you're, I'm, savings loan, those, I, I'm not, they tried to tell me to save for years. I'm telling you, it is the hardest thing in my life because I am not committed, you know. But by the time I know I'm owing, you know, so, 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 and so money, it's one thing I value in my life is peace of mind. Peace, I, I don't want to think that I'm owing anybody. So I walk towards that by force, you know, and I, you know, I've, I've, I've never owed anybody, you know, money before. I've always paid out. Money. So that's what I've always thought about, you know. Right now, I needed, you know, another two million for something I wanted to do. And I'm like, if I don't start it now, you know, the money this two million is supposed to bring for me, it's not going to arrive yeah. until I get this money. Do you understand? So why not I get this money, start it, and bring out, you know, start turning out the investments. So that's how I've grown for the last, you know, for the last, let me say, four years now. I have, I have cut it according to, you know, you know what, I can do this. You know, I make certain, certain amount a year. This small fraction of a loan won't hurt me. I come, stay committed to it. I pay back. And that's how I start you know, acquiring all the assets I've gotten, you know, so far. You know, but the thing is, you know, this is, this is just my mom. This is just, you know, so you have to work hard, you know, to, if you're going to get from anybody, you have to work hard on developing trust. Even with the company I, I, I loan from, because I was so diligent with them, they accepted, you know, I think four or five of my friends have gotten money through me, through my name, basically, because they trust me that money. They were like, Annie, you know, do you vouch for this person? And, you know, I make sure I follow up on the rest of them. And I've also advised, you know, my people to get, you know, all that, you know, because you, you just keep on being lazy. You know, I'm saying, mm, I would get there, I will get there. And before you know it, you know, time has passed. You have nothing in your hands. Savings, nada, you know, you've eaten it or something has come up or whatever. And, okay. you know, so I feel that that was what, you know, pushed me. Wherever you see me right now is because of that, you know. So that's it. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you very much, Annie. Um, so, yes. you know, it was, it was very interesting when you said that um, yeah. um, your loans keep, they, they keep you invested in, in your craft, in your business, you Definitely. know, the same way, you know, if somebody invests in your company too, that's investment, you know. Exactly. You in, exactly. So, you know, I get that very much. Yeah. So, um, um, let's go to you, Goke. Um, so, I think you, you spoke a little bit about this before, but tell us about how or um, how you got your first set of customers. Did you do any form of marketing? Any PR? Was it word of mouth? So um, give us more, shed more light on, on that. All right. Um, so in the in the very early days, um, 2010, um, social media was not really a thing. I'm not even sure there was Instagram in Nigeria, not at all. Um, there was Facebook, but I mean, we, nobody even really saw it then as a as a business tool, as it were. So for us, it was a lot of pounding the streets. Um, basically, we went door to door. I personally, you know, recruited a few of my, you know, um, well, as a family members, and went door to door, um, sharing flyers, telling people about the business. Also, remember, it was quite it was it was quite a challenge because when we started, there was not a lot of awareness about e eating healthy. Um, it wasn't there. So we had to basically build a market right from scratch. So it was more of going door to door. And then we started doing trade shows. So events, you know, trade fairs, and just an opportunity to show our business. In fact, at that point, it was less of making a sale, more of let people know about this business. So we attended a lot of um, things like sports day for schools. 
there were two there are two particular schools around us in Ogba. We used to go to we just go there, we share our flyers, we tell people about our business. So I was going to street shows, going to street fairs, just finding opportunities and events to put our business and brand out there. Of course, we made sales at those events as well, but even more than that, we also, you know, made contacts. And then partnerships worked for us very early in the day. So when the business started struggling, you know, we started looking for who are, uh, who, who, what are those kind of businesses that can complement what we also do? Uh, so we form, we form partnerships, you know, you know, together with other types of business that could increase our own visibility and also increase their own visibility. So it was more like a win-win situation. And, you know, in those early days, you know, th th that was how we really started to bring in, you know, new customers and attract, you know, attract customers. Of course, we also leveraged our network. So church, um, kids, school, you know, what I find these days is that a lot of people have over dependency on social media, which is great. Uh, right now, so fresh does a lot of social media, but aside from, you know, doing a, 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 a lot of social media, you know, um, it's also actually leveraging your network. What are those people in your network? You know, if you're a parent, you go to school, you have, you have um, other parents in the school. Um, if you go to church, you have people in the church. If you belong to other kinds of social, you know, social um, um, groups, you also have people there. You know, so, you know, we leverage a lot on, on, on our network, um, you know, right from that beginning. And that was how the world started, you know, you know getting out. Shredder Gang Bumi was one of the people that we, you know, we partner with early in the days. She was in the healthy space. She was advising people on nutrition, you know, weight management and all of that. So it was just a natural fit. So we did quite a number of things with her in those early days, you know, leveraging on our platform to expose our brand to our audience. And, you know, same way, you know, she exposes our own brand to our own audience. Uh, so I want to say there's a lot of value in social media but you know, there is also a lot of value in trying to, you know, in, in, well, let's say in the more traditional way, that was how we got our first set of customer. Now we also heavily rely on social media, you know, to engage all our, you know, our community and all of that. Uh, but in those very early days, it was, it was those traditional um, means, you know, that, and I think it is still very much valuable today. A lot of the times, people even start if they see if people see a Bumi judge um, take a so fresh product, they're more likely to believe her than if I open a so fresh page to the fresh and say I can do this. So people actually trust people better. So look for people in your in your network, you know, that you can leverage on, and when they start to believe in your product, as long as you have a good product, a good service. They are even, it, even up to now, um, when we track our marketing, you know, um, what is it called, initiative, we still find that word of mouth is still very, very big for us. Word of mouth is still very, very big for us, even though we do a lot of other marketing things. So, you know, um, yeah, I, I would say, you know, um, those, those are the things we did in, in those early days, just going to the streets, putting our products out there, attending trade shows, door to door, you know, finding the right partnerships. And, you know, now we leverage a lot on social media as well. Okay, okay. Um, thanks a lot. Um, that was very insightful. Um, so, Bumi, over to you. Um, so, Shredder Gang has over 158,000 followers on Instagram. You know, that's not something... She's, you the, she's the boss. Yes. It's not something you see every day. You just don't have... 158,000 followers on Instagram, you know. So, um, I don't think some banks have up to that amount of followers on Instagram. So, um, it's been interesting to know how you grew that, that follower base um, in, in, in what I would think is a short amount of time, really. So, um, um, can you give us more, more light on that? Okay, thank you very much for that question. I mean, Shredder Gang um, is one of the largest weight loss and health fitness communities in Nigeria. And the way I have been able to build it is by providing value. 
every single day. So as much as I want to make a sale, I want you to buy from me. I want you to um, come on the next program I'm having. I want you to come on my page and find benefits every single day. Something that relates to either you, your husband, your children, your colleagues, something. Every single day, I want you to learn something from my page. And this is what we do when we think about our content. So content is king. This is the way that I've been able to build each other guys um, large following is by giving valuable content. Like even in, during this pandemic, I kind of switched how I did content, right? So in the first place, let me give for instance, um, another big thing before I, I say that is humanizing the brand, right? Um, in the early days, I used to, like I said, share my authentic story. I was my personal billboard. A lot of people knew me. But as the big business started to really grow and I started to get very busy, um, I, I wanted to, you know, remove myself from being the face of Shredder Gang, right? I wanted the business to grow organically in its own way so that if you remove me from this picture, the business continues to grow because people are not coming solely be because of me, right? So, I mean, we did that for, for a while, but also it's important to understand the different waves that social media throws us, at us, right? So right now, in less than the last two years, People don't buy products, they buy people. Mm -hmm. they buy, they're buying your trust. They're, they're, they're buying your expertise, your own, not what your business stands for, right? Mm -hmm. So I had to then start again, like before, being my own personal billboard, more so in this, in, 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 in this COVID-19 season, where a lot of people are stuck at home, they don't know what to do, they're gaining weight, right? So I started to now come on every single day and give value. This is the first way that I've been able to grow. And I wrote some down. The next one is being regular and consistent. So some people um, in growing your Instagram, your Instagram following. So I'm not, I'm not only growing the numbers. So it's not about numbers. It's not about 160,000 people or 35,000 people. It's in terms of numbers. It is about, you know, the quality of what you're giving to the numbers that you have right now. So for me, I'm not really interested in, oh, I want to go to 200,000 followers in the next week. I'm interested in catering to my 158,000 followers right now. And of course, that yields, you know, with more followers every single day, right? So I'm consistent, I am regular. Every single day, I am doing something. The thing about the Instagram algorithm is if you are not consistent and if you're not regular, they stop putting you in people's mind eye, right? So like the, in your feed, in the feed, you stop showing up. You stop showing up in, in people's feed. So for us, we had to come up with content strategy because for us, we know that content for us equals to sales. So we now have to sit down and say, before we used to do four times a week, probably like four years ago. And then we found out that four times a week was not good enough. In this COVID season, we're doing seven to nine posts every single day because we need to keep our, our community engaged. These people are home. Um, people want to know, if they want to eat something where, where we tweet some or, or we post something, hey, have you done your workout? People are like, oh my goodness, I was just about to eat a charm. Okay, let me put this down and you know, go make a smoothie or something. Right, so being regular and being consistent. Also, I love to talk about what Boke talked about, which is collaborations. Collaborations have been a big deal for us. So collaborating with, with other brands who have, you know, a share kind of like the same voice and our same outlook, right? So, you know, so um, collaborating with a so fresh. So so fresh and Shredder Gang do a lot of a lot of collaborations from beginning of time. Um, we have, for instance, I have taken over So Fresh's page. I think three times, um, where I go a whole day, so fresh does absolutely nothing. I go a whole day on so fresh's page and I'm engaging so fresh's followers, right? And that's in turn, as much as you know, it seems like I'm providing value to so fresh, I am also amplifying my voice to people that I would probably have never met ever. So some people that know so fresh, I don't know anything about Shredder Gang, and I take over their page for one whole day, and they're like, oh. So a Shredder Gang actually exists. All right, I'm going to start following them, right? Let me even see what they have. Let me go on their website. So collaborations have really, really helped us um, um, stay, stay, um, keep our, our, our followership growing. Now, another thing is um, make sure that people trust you, right? So for me, trust is very big. 
and how do I get my, my followers to trust me? I am very authentic, right? So I make sure that I mean what I see and I say what I mean. So I'm a person, I'm a real person. I'm not a robot, I'm not a goddess. I'm a real person who is a woman in her early 30s, who has children, who is working just like you, right? And I try to show you what I do. For instance, a couple of days ago, I, I spoke to them at the beginning of the lockdown. I told them I was going to be working out, I'm going to do this and that. So you have to engage with your audience. Engaging with them, that's how you build trust with them. I told them, I'm going to go on a whatever, whatever. At the end of the 14 weeks, I only lost 3 kg. I didn't come and lie and say, you know what? I have lost 10 kg, guys, this, 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 this. I, th that way, they're able to trust me. I said, guys, I only lost 3 kg in this time. Um, da, da, da. However, I'm, I'm not mad because I did so, 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 so. So, you know, being authentic with my life, being truthful now buys their trust. So they will say, you know what? Actually, uh, I want to continue following you or I want to patronize your business because I feel like you're a trustworthy person. Um, another thing is listening to your audience. So um, a lot of people just go on Instagram and just post and leave, right? People are engaging with you. They want to talk to you. It's like, it's like you're inviting someone into your office and people cannot be in your office and speaking to you and you don't talk back to them, right? So um, we basically just make sure that we interact with everyone who interacts with us in a timely fashion. Um, this is, these are one of the ways that we have been able to um, build such a following and not only a following just in numbers, it's like a, it's like a cult like following. If I come up and say, guys, if you take, buy this pencil, if you do it like this, you, you lose weight, they will buy it because they actually believe because of all these things that I have listed, right? So that's it in a nutshell. All right, thanks a lot for that. Um, we will actually need to move a bit faster now because um, um, time is not really on our side. So, um, so over to you, Annie. Um, so how did you um, get um, your first set of paying clients to pay for your, your photography services? Um, well, that's why, that's why I say, I say um, it's professionally starts, you know, by so, so, so time because that's when they started playing. So it's a professor started by you know 2016 January. That's when I got my first paying client, you know. And I'm going to just say this, it's it's a ripple effect basically. That's what it was. You know, it shows up on this person's page, this person displays what I did, you know, and people ask questions. And I want to I'm also thankful for, you know the friends I have and, you know, basically people online, people around me, you know, they kind of push, you know, my business, you know, to other people referred me and, and that's where, you know, it all picked up. And also I'm going to just, I'm going to say this. I started when I had a nine to five. So some mm. people are in nine to fives right now and they are trying to switch to, you know, being their own boss and running a business and all that. And I'm going to say, I don't know, it doesn't work for everybody. I'm going to say, take it slowly, you know, ease the exit, you know, check it out, make sure, make sure for certain that, you know, it is what it is because, you know, this, what you have is, you know, sure financial security every bond. And I'm not going to lie to you, you have sure, for businesses, it's not really like that, you know. There are a lot of times things don't work out, you know, the way you think it will a certain more. So that's how I, I started when I was working, you know. Um, I was working in a place where, you know, my my boss had this big house and it was only him in it. And that's where I started shooting. I asked him if I could you know, use the living room. There was nothing there. And that's where I started shooting and, you know, working up my skill level until a place where I knew where business was functioning fine and I knew I could place my, uh, what's called, my um, letter to resign and I left because I was making a certain amount of, so if there's something you're doing right now, you know, keep doing it. Also, you know, keep working with your business. You have to put time into two of them and find, you know, balance. By the time you see there is, you know, there's money, there's traction on that, you can easily just move out. But I got, I got business basically, word of mouth, social media, you know. By the time I pull work out, you put solid, by the, 
by the time what you want to do for my type of business is by the time anybody gets to your portfolio or your page all they need to do is basically just go there you like, oh okay okay sure you can do it that's all they don't need to they don't need to go there and start really looking you know to convince you know what you want to do is put your work down work you know even though it's going to take you a while make sure you get your skills right make sure everything is on par with people that by the time people you know encounter you by the time they see your work you know they already know that yes he can do the job he's capable and you know they don't need extra convention so that's that's what helped me really you know everybody that came everybody that was directed to my page was convinced and all they needed to know was price basically if it fit their budget and that's all okay yeah all right so um this will be the last set of questions before we, we go to the um, live questions um so um okay um what were your um your biggest challenges when so fresh was just starting out Okay, um, I mean, very many challenges. Um, the, the biggest of them was actually cracking the market. So getting the customers to walk into the store. Um, it was a new market, it was a new um, model, it was new products we were selling. It was not really, the, the, the market was not used to, I mean, 2010, I, I always see Nigerians didn't even see salad as food. It was just small coast law you put by the side of rice at Arti. So it was very difficult, you know, um, getting people to appreciate what we were doing that early on. And so sales was very low and, you know, um, expenses was mounting and all of that. So it was very challenging actually, um, you know, breaking even at that very early stage. We also had a lot of issues with, you know, infrastructural deficit. We, I mean, we, we know what the country is. Our business is very reliant on power to be able to preserve um, preserve the fresh produce and all of that. And there's almost nothing we can do in, if, you don't, if you didn't have constant power. So, you know, struggling with that, with that part of it was really quite challenging. Um, also, um, um, human resource, um, it was quite tough um, at that very early stage to be able to get people to do and see the vision, um, how we wanted it to be, because we wanted to set a kind of standard. We didn't want it to just be like every other Nigerian business where you know people are like a car, the service wasn't good and all of that. So, and, and so at that early stage, it was kind of difficult. But we had to go through that, you know, through our systems and our structures, you know, putting in policies and all of that training. But at the very beginning, the, it was quite challenging getting the kind in you know, the right kind of people issues. So if you've ever run business in NGO from government, there's always an agency out there trying to fleece and you know um, make this difficult for you. So those are those are some of the you know challenges we faced early on. But you know, like like in business, um, a lot of the times is in solving and you know overcoming those challenges. That actually, you know, start, you know, it begins to, you know, put your business out there, and you know, as you begin to walk, you know, to 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 resolve those those issues, the business, you know, keeps on growing. So those are one of the challenges we faced, you know, early on. Also, location was a big challenge for us. Um, remember, we started out in Uba, and the, the the truth was that that was when we started. That was all the that was all what we had saved could could afford. And so even that location itself became a problem for us to be able to attract the right kind of customers early on. Um, so those, those, those are some of the challenges we faced you know, early in the life of the business. Okay. So um, um, for me, let's throw the same question at you. What were your biggest challenges when Shredder Gang were just starting out? Um, for me, thankfully, I didn't have a lot of issues, to be very honest. Um, I don't know if it's, this is because of the business model um, or I'll say maybe mostly because of the business model, but I'll say that the biggest challenge that we had was actually getting people to um, realize that this actually works. Why? Because this was a digital weight loss business. So it was online, something that somebody had actually never seen. People were still in the era of touch and feel. How will you have me lose weight if you have not even seen me? You can't even touch me. Are you going to come and take my weight? Are you going to check you know, um, my height? 
how do you know that what you're going to do is going to work, right? So those were the biggest challenges um, that we faced, uh, that I faced in the beginning. Um, but it was just educating that you know what, if possible, just fill the online form, send whatever we asked you to send, and then I'll get back to you. So, you know, for them, a lot of, a lot of, um, and, and in the beginning, I actually had a lot of um, older clients, to be very honest. Like, it's even now that the demographic has changed. So in the, in the beginning, in the beginning, my demographic was mostly between 35 to 65. Um, it's only as the years have gone by that it's, 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 it's getting, you know, it's younger. In the early stages, I had mostly women who were in their 40s on average. And they were very used to um, a person who would actually come to see them because maybe they were big madams, right? But I had to keep pushing and saying, no, I don't have to see you. This is how this business works. Um, and after, you know, educating them here and there on this, this is why, you know, uh, this will work or go, actually going to go and see them the first time and letting them know they're not a scam. Um, you know, cause sometimes you have to bend over backwards to please a customer. And so, um, some of them going to see them one or two times. And then of course, carrying on the entire process again, digitally was the biggest issue. Also getting people to eat a certain way. Now in 2013, people were only used to taking weight loss pills drinking some sort of herb um, that would help them lose weight or drinking shakes or whatever. So they didn't understand eating a certain way, right? So, you know, um, eating, you know, having a smoothie, taking some fruits, eating whatever. They did all of this for leisure to add to whatever it is that they were eating before, right? And so just educating them, you know, was, was a task, was an uphill task to be very honest because you hear people tell you that, people tell me, but my father ate this way, nothing happened to him. He lived till he was 99, did not die. Why should this happen? Why should I be eating this a certain way? So you mean I won't eat this? So I think that was the biggest issue, but really educating them and having an answer and actually teaching them. Um, because for me, I believe that when you educate someone, they're able to understand better as opposed to just telling them this is what you should do. So I, I did a lot of education, a lot of education is what I was doing in the beginning. And I think it was a little bit daunting to be very honest because repeating yourself over and over again um, is a bit tough, right? It's like teaching a two-year-old to, to be to potty train, right? But um, at the end, it worked. So those were my biggest issues in the beginning. That's great. Um, so Annie, this yeah. one's for you. Um, you know, this one is my, I, I'm really looking forward to the answer to this one. Um, so you've had some, some, some very high profile clients, the likes of Whiskey, Don Jazzy, I think MI too, and so on, you know? So how did you manage to get such clients? Hi, right, I'm going to say I'm going to say this, and um, it's it's very very simple. It's very simple. All they need to know, all they need to know is that you do good work. Okay. Everybody likes free things. I'm going to say this facts. So all they know, if it is free, one, second, it is really good. Two. That that's mainly it. If they have time they are going to come, do you understand, and take good f photos. So mm -hmm. that, was, that was the beginning. That was the beginning part, you know. I had a great portfolio. It was easy to convince anybody, come take a photo. I want to do something with you. But as I, you know, grew, you know, having, you know, by the time you post any of your colleagues, you know, it's easy. It's easier. So if they go to your, their, your page, they see, um, on Jazzy, they sit on the Lumelu, they were like, okay, 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 okay. It's very easy. It's just like, oh, you know, he has shot my pairs, you know, sure. You know, what's, what, what, so it's, those are the, those are really the two things. If you have great work, you know, also, <laughs> if it's free or discounted, thirdly, you know, you're shot their pairs, it's easy. It's pretty easy. It's not, it's not okay. anything big with celebrities, yeah. All right. All right, that's great. So letting your work speak for you. Yeah, um, so definitely. now we're going to go um, to a few live questions. We, have, we actually quite have a lot. Um, let's, let, let's, let's try and go through this as fast as we can. So we have um, Godwin Iyama. Um, hi, thanks for putting this together. I have two questions. I thought point to register your business be top of mind. Um, number two, if, partnership, if a partnership is being considered, what is the ideal way to kick off bearing in mind legal and contractual agreements. Thank you. So, um, you know, um, um, let's start with you, Goki. 
Um, at what point should you consider registering your business? From the from the word go, I, I think it's very important. Just um, if 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 once you decide I want to start running a business, it's good to start putting the legal structures in place. Um, you could start registering a business name. Um, that is sole proprietorship. You know, it is not very expensive. But I'll say from the word go. Also, if you are going to run a partnership, I think two things are important. One, the legal structure. So you need to have, it's even more important if it's going to be a partnership to have a legal structure in place. Um, uh, have shareholders agreement, have a you know a partnership agreement. But more importantly than legal agreement, the reality is that things will happen in business. And sometimes you may not even be able to effectively take advantage of the legal, you know, legal um, uh, stuff. So, but I'll say more importantly is for both of you or more than two or three of you to understand one, have a very clearly defined goal and mission for the organization so that everybody is aligned to why are we doing this and what are we going to do. So the vision, the mission must be clearly you know, aligned and everybody must agree to the direction the business is going. Secondly, you want to have very clear defined roles. I mean, very clear defined role. Who is doing what? Who is responsible for what? And how will you keep yourselves accountable? So if I'm responsible for finances and markets, for example, and you are responsible for um, sales and operation, who keeps me responsible? Who am I accountable to? You also need to be able to be accountable to each other. You want to set parameters and metrics where you know, use to measure each other. And I would say keep the lines of communication open as much as possible. Um, so you're meeting regularly, might be weekly, might be bi-weekly, or you're constantly aligning you know, your, your ideals. One thing that also causes a lot of issue in partnership is finances. So you want to be very clear how you're going to treat finances. Some people want to spend profit as it comes in. It's not bad. Some people want to reinvest it and grow the business. So what do you want to do? What is your philosophy about managing money? What's your philosophy about treating the company finances? So you have to quickly put together all those guidelines on how things are going to in, you know, evolve. I'll say if it actually involves a lot of capital, you want a good partnership or shareholders agreement for both of you. So that, don't take things for granted. Don't say it's my friend for 15 years, 20 years, my wife. There's nothing like that. Business just introduces, you know, some very strange, you know, parameters that could make things go south. You never know how you are going to respond to when issues are right. So I'll say structure right from the beginning. Okay. Okay. All right. So, um, um, let me ask you this for me. So, um, another question, how do you identify a need when it seems like almost all needs have been met? Hmm. Okay. So, um, I think first of all, not all needs have, oh, not all needs have been met. I don't think it's, I don't think we we'll ever get to a place where all needs are met. So let's change that mindset, first of all. But if it seems like everything that you want to do is, um, is saturated, find something that, for me, find, find something that you do well at, that you do good at. You know, maybe you are very, you're a very good salesperson. You know, maybe find a business that you enjoy doing and then market it as much as possible. Right. So if you even say, for instance, if you say, oh, the market is so saturated, um, how do I how do I stand, stand out? Because I mean, oh, everybody has what they're doing right now. For me, I believe that as long as you have a voice and you are your own authentic person and you sell um, as much as you want, you have your own clients that will come to you. So for me, I will say. Make sure that what you're choosing to do, you're passionate. Well, people say don't, you don't have to be passionate about what you're doing, but I'll say be passionate about it because when those times come, when you feel like, oh my God, I can't go on anymore, it's just that passion that kind of swells you. So I think the first thing I'll say to you is not all, needs are, not all needs are met, to be very honest. I think it's just sitting down and thinking about a, a, a niche in a need that you already know about, right, that needs... Let me give you an example. So in, in Nigeria right now, they do a lot of plays. Forget that if there was no COVID-19, 
right? They do a lot of plays, uh, maybe every season, Easter, Christmas, you know, and they're like a live play at maybe Terra Culture or at, um, at uh, whatever place they do the plays. And actually, yesterday I thought about it. I said, nobody has actually started doing plays for children with children as the cast. So in your own mind, you are thinking everybody's doing plays now. I don't have anything to offer. If you now decide that you're going to have a full children um, cast as, you know, doing the play, and then your target audience is inviting children to come, that is where you have built a, a niche out of a need that has already been established by some other people, right? So I think it's actually looking at a need that you're passionate about and then finding a niche and niche down there and do as much as possible as you can do. I think that would be my answer. Okay, all right. So um, we actually have a lot of questions. I don't think we need to go through all of them, but uh, I'll try my best here. So we need to move a bit faster. So Ali, uh, let me ask you this. How do you price your service? Uh, you know, how do you know what price to charge clients? Um, I think, first of all, you have to check, check around and uh, know what the prices of your colleagues are. Then, you know, put... Uh, figure out your place you know, among your colleagues, you know, and know, okay, am I, am I, you know, should I follow this level or do you, you know, am I, I'm not up to them. Should I bring it a bit down? Because in our, in our, um, in our service, not, not everybody's on the same level, basically. So, you know, it kind of, whatever, whatever your power is, you know, you put your price right there, whatever your value is, you put, right there so i think whatever you think your pride is your your value is put a price on it um like um in a couple of years i i stuck to one price i stuck to one race card because uh because i had things to do basically what what i also said before the loans to furnish and all that not that i couldn't increase it do you understand but i needed i didn't need any disturbance in the flow of cash at that moment in time. But I had finished everything by last year and I was ready to, you know, I've always wanted to double it and all that, but I always wanted to increase it. But now I was more comfortable to be like, you know what, if nobody comes or whatever, or it trickles down, that's fine, you know. I'm in this level, you know, for, for photography, it's right there. You find your value, know what you're giving to your customers, then put, you put a price on it. It's that simple. It's that okay. simple. You have to know what works for you. Do. Okay. All right. So a lot of people have been asking this, you know, and it's quite funny how many people have been asking this. What? Let me let me ask you this, um, Buke. What business can someone start with one million naira? So honestly, that that's a question I usually don't answer, and I I also think there is no answer for that business. There is. <laughs> I, I'll perhaps say there's almost no business that you can't start with one million. And what I mean is you can start from any level. Mm -hmm. I think asking people what kind of business to start. Um, so personally, you know your question I answer because I really can't tell you what kind of business to start. But you have to look at your environment. Um, one, what, what do you find that is a challenge to be solved? Mm -hmm. So, for example, so fresh was a personal challenge. So, when I where I grew up in Ilori, it was a very quiet agrarian community. So, I was used to eating fresh fruits and vegetable. I, we practically had trees of fruits and vegetable in our house. So, when I moved to Lagos, I didn't like the kind of fruits and vegetable that was in a bit to solve my own personal, you know, will I say challenge or pain. The same thing for, for Bumi, it was personal to her. So I think sometimes, you know, a lot of the times business opportunities are personal. So look around you, um, what, what are the opportunities? What are people struggling with? What do your friends complain about? What do you complain about all the time? Where do you think you can add, add, add value? Um, and almost any kind of business you think about, you can actually start, you know, with, with, with one million naira. Uh, it's going to be difficult for me to start really now in you know, types of businesses. Uh, obviously, if you want to, if you want to sell um, food, you can you can start with a million. You can even start with much less. But I think more important is to look at what are your own 
abilities, what are your own competences, and then what opportunities do you see and are you equipped to solve it? So, you know, it has to be a lot of introspection and thinking deep about what you can what you can do. And I want to speak to the, uh, the question Bumi answered. So, you know, she was right in saying not all needs have been met, and many needs that have been met, businesses just, new businesses just start to find new ways to meet them. That is just it. The three of us on this panel, we did not do anything new. We only found more unique ways, more interesting ways, more convenient ways, faster, easier, better ways of doing it. They talk of any business today. Um, so human needs are basic. They will always be there. Communication, food, relevance, all of that. Businesses will just find unique ways or easier, better alternative, faster ways to solve them. So that's what you want to do. If you want to go into the photography business, is there anything you can bring? Is there anything you can add that is new? And you know, th that way you can you know, bring up a, a good business idea. Yeah. All right, Bumi, uh, let me ask you this. Um, um, so how do we reach out to a particular niche of people um, who will be able to purchase our products, especially for an online business, reaching a niche? Okay, so um, that's a great question. So how do you reach out, especially if you're online? So for me, is identifying who is my customer. So am I, is my customer a pregnant woman? I'm just you know, speaking hypothetically. Where does she go? Who are her friends? When she's on, on the socials, when I say socials, I mean also across all social media platforms. Where does she go? What are the things that she wants to see? So, for instance, if your target, if your niche is a working woman, where does she go? What are the types of pages that she visits when she goes on social media, right? Mm -hmm. So you need to be there, right? And then marketing your, 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 your product. So some people don't, um, don't like it, but you can do direct marketing or you can go on those uh, pages. So, for instance, like I said, the first person is a pregnant woman. She goes to maybe babies and more. Babies are more, they talk about a lot, of, uh, a lot of issues with motherhood, with breastfeeding and all of that. And you always go there and you leave strategic comments. When you leave strategic comments on those sorts of pages, people will always click. Let me see who this is, right? Or you can actually go there and then target to particular women on the feed. And maybe you've had a conversation maybe under their comments. You write something to them, you drop into their DM, uh, um, uh, introduce yourself, and then markets, right? So, you know, that's one thing that you, that you can do. Also, make sure, like I said, with my own page, this is what I did, I made sure that I was giving value. When you give value, people will always gravitate towards you, always. They always want to see what you're talking about. So if you're selling something online, which I think is one of the easiest ways these days, is all you need to is make sure that your content is great. When your content is great, you find that people will gravitate towards you. Right. Another thing you can do now, because now, you know, um, the, the Instagram algorithm and Facebook and all that stuff is hard. What you can do is do sponsored ads as well. So when you go on a sponsored ad, there are specific demographics that you can choose to where you want, you know, who you want to see what you're sponsoring. So if you want to, you know, a woman that's between 16 to 32 to see it, you click that. You want it to be a female, you click that. You want it to be social, so you click that, right? So that it actually brings it down and it only, and, and it just, you know, pushes it out to the people who you actually want to see. So that would be my, that would be my answer to you. Okay. All right. Thanks a lot. So, Annie, um, uh, we need to move a bit faster. We're almost done. Um, um, so, Annie, this one is for you. Uh, do you ever get scared with the saturation of the photography industry in Nigeria? No, uh, no, I do, I'm, I'm never scared um, about that. That's that. Okay, so that for me personally, that's not my that's not my problem. You know, that's not my problem. I I have grown from you know where I I didn't believe anybody you know work work with me to where I am today, and I am fine with whatever number of customers I have. So what I am now doing, you know, I was talking to someone the other day, I'm finding the next thing to do. I have opened, I've gotten another business, you know, 
to run right now that is bringing you know funds also so what i am doing now is i have seen there's like a trajectory you know for you know for what we do you know i was once nobody you know yeah. and i have now come you know to the top do you understand so i know that a lot of young people are coming do you understand they're coming and i'm coming to you know with a bang that should be my problem that should be my fear do you understand anybody mm -hmm. can come and we play. this is life this is what the job is you know somebody better will come fine that's fine me i want to be in a place where i'm not afraid of that so what you what whatever the fear really is not about saturation mm -hmm. the fear is really about stop of inflow of cash or money really because if yeah. there was any it was always something that brought you cash i don't think anybody would care about you know oversaturation so what you want to do now since that is the major problem is not unless you're just somebody that enjoys fame or whatever it is i don't i don't know but what you want to do is now find another thing or a couple of things where you can now while you're on top or while you're getting there start focusing you know your minds to other things you can do maybe variations of your work or that other ways you can pro, you know provide services other ways you can also make money to that you have ideas of how to run run and that way by the time you have multiple flow of it you're not concerned about you're not concerned about one right now i'm going to say this you know online i am finding you know my exit strategies before five years you know out of photography you know if i am here still no problem you understand but i want to be in a place where i really don't care about this in five years that kind of thing so i think that should be people's mindset find multiple find something else if you're on the top don't worry about saturation find something else you're good at more than you think okay all right, that's great. Um, so, um, um, okay, you know, I want to, you know, since we're about strapped for time, I want to combine two questions here. Um, so, is it important to have a mentor while starting up or growing your business? One, number two, how does one over, overcome the fear of failure before running a business? That's for me, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, so mentor. Um, if you find a physical mentor, great. Um, it can help you um, to navigate the challenges and point you in the right direction. But I want to clearly say that the work eventually, or ultimately, it's on you. Um, starting out, I didn't start with any mentor. I didn't even know anybody I could go to. I practically learned by myself. But what advantage do you have? You have the internet at the palms of your hands right now. You have podcasts. You have articles, even on Twitter. So, for example, right from when I joined Twitter, I was very deliberate about the kind of people I follow. I have many people that, you know, I can call them mentors because I learn from them every day, either on Twitter, even on, even on Instagram. So you have all those platforms, YouTubes. Those are opportunities for you to learn and, you know, um, what's it called, gain from other people's experiences. So definitely you need guidance, you need help, you need mentorship, but it necessarily doesn't have to be physical. As you go along in the business, let me even tell you something I discovered about mentorship. Once you prove your value, most of the time, mentor will naturally come to you. People who even love to mentor people that are already on the right track. That is just the reality that I've found. So yes, mentorship has a lot of benefit. It doesn't have to be physical. You can leverage on all the platform, even boots, you know, to, to, to get mentorship. What's the second question? Um, um, the, the, how do you overcome the fear of failure? Before yeah, you how do you overcome the fear of failure? Um, um, so it's by doing, right? Um, it will always be there. The fear will always be there. The, the chances that you will fail will always be there. That is the reality. Right? There's nothing certain. Your job is one to actually do. So start it and most importantly, learn as you go. Learn as you go on, on the journey. So learn from your customers. Learn from what the market is saying. Learn from other people that are being in those kind of situations. So just learn, learn, learn. But you know, so I just do and learn, and you continue to evolve your business, evolve your strategy. 
you never, um, you know, uh, oh, how do I put it? Like the plans you have at the beginning is not always how it pans out. So it's for you, you know, learning as you go, knowing when to shift, knowing when to adjust, knowing when to change direction, knowing when to expand and, and, and all of that. So, you know, over time it, it becomes intuitive, but it, you will never overcome that fear by sitting down. It's only if you make a move and take a step. Um, that, that's how I address that um, that question. Okay, um, so for me, let's go to you. Um, I recently started a souvenir events management company, um, and I have had like four people who have consulted me, but none have gotten back. It's a bit discouraging. How do I manage such disappointments? Okay, fantastic question. I mean, I think it's even just jump on, you know, where Goki just left off is disappointment is part of business. You know, you have to grow tough skin, to be very honest. Thick skin. Thick skin. When people say no, for every maybe four no's, you're going to get two yeses, right? So one thing that I do is I make sure that I don't internalize a no to say, oh, maybe they don't think I'm good enough. Maybe they don't think I'm worth it. Maybe they don't think my business is great. That is none of my business. The reason why they didn't choose me is none of my business. I want to let that roll off my back like water and then move on to the next person who will actually... Um, buy from me. And if the next person says no, you keep going. Do not internalize that. I know, for instance, I, I can already tell that that person is a woman because usually women are very, very emotional. We are emotional beings. So we kind of like internalize every kind of feedback that we get and think that it has something to do with us or our worth. So I'll say that, first of all, do not attach your worth to your business. So the fact that your business is doing well, oh, I feel good. My business is not doing well. Oh, I don't feel good. I'm depressed. Somebody said no to me, I'm depressed. Somebody said yes to me, oh my goodness, I'm happy. So you need to, first of all, take care of that, your emotional state, that it doesn't go up and down because of you know, disappointments or because you landed a big deal with MI, right? You have to make sure that you are able to just let disappointments roll off your back. I have gotten a lot of no's. I got a lot of no's in the year 2019, but I didn't let that affect me. I just told myself, you know, this is a part of business. You are not always going to get yeses. And of course, many times you don't learn from, me, from your yes. You learn from your no. Why did they say no? Why do I think they said no? Why do I think that these people didn't want to work with me? Is this something that has to do with my, my business model? Is this something about how I projected myself? Is it about my email? I look at it and I think about how can I make it better as I pitch myself to the next person, right? So always learn from the no's as well. It's not a bad thing. No's actually make you better. It makes you a better um, business person. My business has not grown by all the people that said to me, great job. My business has grown by people that say you suck. And I think about why they said I suck. And I collect that feedback uh, and, and then move with it. I always ask, you know, just send a feedback, ask it for a feedback. Could you tell me why you didn't think that this, 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 this? Some people will answer, some people wouldn't. But even if they don't answer, that's okay. Move to the next person and get your work done. If you, as you continue getting more news, you keep bettering your processes and your business. You, keep, you start getting yeses. So keep up the good work, you know, let your spirits be high and, uh, and keep pitching yourself. The more you do, the more you find people that will say yes to you. Okay. All right. That's great. Um, so Annie, let me ask you and combine two questions too. Um, first, where did Roberts come from in your name, in the Annie Roberts? And number two, um, um, I'm a freelance professional photographer. I have been on it for a decade now. During that time, I used, I used to support myself through school. Now I'm planning to expand uh, my brand through my savings on PiggyVest. My savings isn't enough to start my dreams to do yet. You know, but I feel, um, I feel the little I can't can start something. So my question is, what do you have me do? Should I start small and open a small space or do I continue to, to grow my savings to get to where I want? Um, okay, so um, Robert is my middle name, so that clears that up. And um, uh, what's it called? For, for people that want to start, this is always what I tell them. Like, most times they always think it's these things. I mean, of course, it involves money. But every, I want to tell people that, you know, I started from a place where I didn't have any gear, you know, for two years. Mm -hmm. He use. I'm sure it has a system. I'm sure it has Photoshop. And learn how to make your pictures really great. Yeah, learn how to make them, you know, of top quality. If you have a camera, you know, think, during this time you think you can't do anything or you think you can't grow, what you have to do is sit down, 
you know, and build portfolio up, you know, while doing the little you can. Build our type of job is where you can you can do stuff in the background. Maybe people are not seeing it, but it's like you're storing up stuff. You're storing up stuff. At some point, somebody want to see all this stuff you've stored up for them to get you. So this this is this is where what has worked for me. I worked, you know, during three years I had no gear. I had just my laptop and Photoshop. You know, you I'm sure this person has a camera. What I learned was, was how to make great pictures in the back end before I even carry the camera. So there are stuff you can do without money for sure. Build portfolio that you know, I'm sure we, I don't I don't want us to deceive ourselves, especially photographers, that you know is great. If it's not great, keep trying to get better. There's enough uh, material and resource online for us to get better. Do that. When you're there, you know, for sure, for sure, start building little by little. Start reaching out little by little, you know, and you know, from there, you never know where you can get to. But make sure you're prepared. You don't want to go build or you want to go forward and invest and carry, buy the best camera and buy whatever it is. And mm -hmm. want to, who are you? By the time you want to reach anybody, they are going to say, What have you done? It's always the question, Where is your work? For creative, that is always the question, Where is your work? Do you understand? So, where, by the time they ask that question, make sure in your heart of hearts, you're ready for anybody that comes to you and you show them what you got. So, that's what I have to say. Okay, all right, thanks a lot. Um, um, so I think this should be the last set of questions for now, um, because we're, we're out of time. So, um, Buki, I think it's perfect for you. Um, so, how do you know the right location to open a, a an outlet? Very good question. Um, location has to do with who is your target audience. And let me also say, in 2020, location doesn't have to be physical. First of all, you want to ask yourself, does it have to imagine Piggy Vest opens a physical store and say, come and be saving your money every day? It's not going to work. But they're on a location. They're in their best location right now. So you first of all want to determine what's the best location to find my customers. How can they reach me easily? And how can I reach them easily? So I think for location, it has to be about the customer. If it's going to be a physical location, then you want to ask yourself. What are, the be what are the requirements or criteria? So for example, for Stu Fresh, we have about eight, seven criteria for choosing a location. Uh, it must be, for example, it must be where you have commercial and residential. We want to have a mix of both. And then even the parking space, um, it must have a front and a back exit because of the kind of business we do. And so there are all those requirements you want to look at, you know, that favors your business. Does it even have a parking space? Yes, you know, parking space is tough in Lagos, but we're not going to have a location that at least cannot park three to four cars. It doesn't just make sense. And so, you know, you want to look at all those criteria, but the most important one is where are my customers going to be easily, conveniently able to find me there? Also, it depends on your business model. So let me, I'm in the restaurant business. Um, so I'm going to compare two restaurants. If you take a so fresh and let me say a, an Iris VP, the kind of locations where you have RSBP, Talendo, the, the, all, all those kinds, is on the high street. Because of the kind of amb ambience they want to create, people want to go there, you know, um, you know, codedly and, you know, just enjoy their meal and all of that. But for a so fresh, or let me say a Chicken Republic, that we sell, you know, 1,000 having our products, you don't want to go and hide the answer in VI. It must be where somebody is passing, can see it, and immediately make a dash in and dash out. So you have to look at your business model. How best can you serve your customer? I would say location has to always be about the customer. How can they reach you easily? How can you reach them easily? Okay, that's, I, I like that. I like the answer. Um, so, um, but main question for you, how do you handle retention, especially lazy people who drop out of a workout plan, you know, it's quite funny. Okay, so I mean, those will always happen in the yeah. in nature of this business. People will always fall off. However, there's something I've found is that when 
you you find out first of all the type of clients that you have so over the years i have i've been able to categorize clients into three first of all i'll tell you two there are clients who do not do well in groups because they are introverts they don't talk much um they will never contribute and it's easy for them to actually just hide now you have clients so those clients are actually one-on-one -on -one clients there are clients who you should take on one on one, even if they tell you that, you know, I can do anything. You already know your gut is telling you that this one is not going to work. From your interaction on the phone, you should be able to tell a client when you do a consultation with them. I don't know how you run your business. However, when I do a consultation with a customer over the phone and I talk to them for 20 minutes, I can already round them up into a, a, a mode and put them in, right? So another person who, um, is an extrovert who loves to talk, who wants to see what everybody, this person in Lokoja is doing, what this person in America is doing, what this person in Crossover is doing. I already know that person is not going to do well as a one-to-one -one client. If I put her one-to-one, -one, she's going to tell me that my business, that my, that my services are nonsense. Why? Even if I'm giving her a hundred percent because she doesn't have anybody that is motivating her or that she's just in with, right? So you have to always know what mode to put your clients in. So for me, we have been able to learn and understand that when we have a conversation with a client. Some of people, you can actually outrightly ask them. However, some people don't even know themselves. They will say, yeah, I like to be in a group. Then they're in the group and they don't talk, right? So you have to go the extra mile and understand your clients. And then, for instance, if you put that person who loves to chat in a chat group, you find out that at the end of the group, they will sell your business to a hundred other people. Maybe you were, how you did great. However, that same person, if you kept them as one-to-one, -one, they will tell of how horrible the service was. They'll say, oh, she only spoke to me once a day because they were expecting to be engaged for 12 hours in a day because you have some high maintenance clients. So you have to understand what a client is and what a client's needs are and meeting those needs, right? Also, they have clients that no matter what you do, they will still fall off. And that's just reality of life. You have to just encourage them. And, you know, if they fall off, then at the end of the day, they, they, they're falling off. There's really nothing you can do as much as you have tried your best to try and encourage them to keep them going. At the end of the day, it's their human will that you're working with. You can't really work with someone that's already giving up. There's nothing much that you can do, right? You can always just make sure that you always end on a great note. Don't say, well, you just, you're just lazy. You didn't even do well. Then you just get out of my program. No, you actually have to make sure that even though okay, you didn't meet your goal, um, but hey, you learned X, Y, Z. So you actually make them feel good about the process of what they came to do so you didn't get your goal of 10 kg however you have you now learn to eat well you now at least work out three times a week you know so that's very very important yeah so um Annie, this one's for you um have you ever had creative blocks and doubted yourselves and um if yes how did you um get over them i i, I really I, well the thing is i stuck up uh, I stock up in spirit. I stock up on inspiration, you know, that kind of thing. I make sure I'm looking out nothing less than, you know, 200 photos a day of related stuff, you know, and I'm saving them. I'm, I have a bank for them. Do you understand? Because everybody's coming to you to create magic and create unique magic. That's, that's for them only. So everything can not come from your head. You have to always make sure that at any point in time, you, are, you can go back to your bank, pick something up that inspires you to do something new, you know, and go. So I'm, I'm really never stuck creatively. Sometimes, the few times I've been stuck creatively was when I had to beat my work. So unless I, I release, like recently, I've released some stunning you know, images. Now, the worrying part about that is that I have to be on par with, with those type of things or make, or make better images. So that's the only problem I face where I have to now sit down and now say, okay, you know what? It will take me a while, but I have to think of how, of what way or what I can make, what I can do to make things better. But yeah, I just stock up. Make sure you look at a lot of things. Make sure you look at the best people in the game. Make sure you find out. Make it as a point of contact to always look at people better than you. Always look at people doing things differently. Go and find them from wherever they are. You know, if you're in this game, go and find out people doing 
amazing things. Go and look for many so that you don't run out of uh, you can look. There is something you can see in them that you say, yeah, I can take this part and do. You know, so I think that's that's how to overcome it. Yeah, that's great. So um let's let's go to the last set of questions from us, not from these are not live questions, these are from from um, the, the main questions. So, um, okay, let's start with you. Any advice for any um, aspiring entrepreneur who wants to start a business in this pandemic? In this pandemic, start a business. Yeah. All right, that's a very tricky one. Um, I would say, you know, more like a summary of everything we've said here is first of all, you need to understand the market, understand your customers. Um, what, what is the value that you're bringing to the market first and foremost? So you want to clearly define that. Is, is, that, is, is that a need right now? Um, is it going to be a pain or you know, are you going to be serving a painkiller, a vitamin as you usually say? So you want to clearly define what solution you're bringing into the market. The, the, the next thing I, I would say is that you also need to understand your business, the sector. So th there is a place for understanding, you know, what the, the important, you know, parameters are, you know, like, like Annie just said, have you taken time to understand what others are doing in that market? Where are you bringing extra value? So I find that these days, a lot of people are going into the food business because, you know, many businesses are, are shut down. But are they bringing anything new? Why would they leave their old food vendor to come to you? So you want to ask yourself that question. And advice mm -hmm. I always also give to entrepreneurs is you need to understand business. Business is a language on its own. And you want to understand some basic things about business. So I say before you learn that business, many online resources, you can actually take a course on, on business management. So understand how business should run and, and, and all of that. So I'll say understand, you know, the market, your customers, understand your own products and where you're bringing value. And then I'll say lastly, ask yourself, what is the best way to deliver this product or services? Honestly, right now, I would, I would be very wary of any business trying to open up a physical location at this point. It, it, it's, it's not that it won't be lucrative in the long run, but I tell you in the short run, six to 12 months, you're probably going to struggle. So you want to ask yourself, what is the best way to deliver this service or deliver this product? Is this social media, is it YouTube? You know, so ask yourself these questions. Do, um, so a, a, a friend of us recently said, you know, she wanted to start a business. And what we did for us, first of all, can you get a hundred people? She said, yes. Do a Google form. Ask these hundred people some seven to eight sets of questions. Let the customers you are going to serve, let them tell you what they want, how they want to be served. So do your research, do your feedback before you launch that business. Okay. Okay, that's great. Um, Bumi, it's nice for you. Um, so any advice for anyone who wants to start a fitness brand or a service-oriented business? Um, so I'll say really you know have a vision you know and build your business model based on that vision but always be willing to move as the tides move in terms of your business model how you expect your business to run again look at nobody expected covid19 and so a lot of people have had to you know pivot and so make sure that you're not you know standing so straight that you're like you know what this is is either this or we are going to die right make sure that you're flexible enough you know to be able to turn if you need to turn and i'll say you know the thing about it, this business also is you have to take calculated risk i wanted to say risk but i'll say calculated because um you want to make sure that you know the the risk that you take don't kill you so make sure that you take a lot of also because the industry is kind of is is still fairly new is what i would say i mean this 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 new craze of fitness only began really maybe like in 2014 and so we're just like six years into it. still a fairly fairly new um and budding industry so i'll say you need a lot of things that uh, that are not um available to us yet that are available if you take a you know a cue and actually provide that you know but it would actually involve you taking a risk 
So there are many things that I have done with Shredder Gang that is risk-taking. Some have done well, some haven't. However, we keep moving regardless, right? Also, I'll say be frugal. So in the beginning, you may want to, in, 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 in the bid to be, you know, to show like, you know, you have so much to offer. You want to deal with so much aesthetics. You want to open multiple places so quickly. I'll say be very interested in growing organically. This is one thing I'll say that has kept me over time is organic growth. Understanding that, you know what, one plus one is equal to two. Two plus two is equal to four. Don't try to go from one to 100 in the first one to two years. Actually, be very, very, very interested in growing organically. And then, you know, when you find a level ground that you feel that, you know, you're standing strong, you can then start to think about growing exponentially. But in the beginning, I'll say that, you know what, take the organic growth very seriously. Be frugal. Be very, very frugal in your business. There are many things that you don't need in the beginning. There are lots of people who tell you that you need, you need to do this. There are lots of people who started just after me and their business have crumbled now because in the beginning, they expanded so quickly. They were getting nine staff, 10 staff. And I'm like, what is 10 people doing? You know, if this business just started, what are they doing? But you wanted to show off of your media and to people that you're actually doing very well. They have many customers. Meanwhile, you're not making any profits, right? So make sure that you grow organically and that you can, you know, you bootstrap that way in the next five to seven years, 10 years, you find that, you know, um, like for me, for instance, I mean, this is not to say there's anything wrong with taking loans. I have never, I have never taken a loan because of the way that I have decided to grow. There are many things that I want to do, but I know that I can't do them now because I don't have the money for it. If I decide in the next two years that, you know what, I want to take this, 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 this step, I can then decide to take a loan because I know that I have put the processes in place and everything is working like a cycle organically that would help me pay off my loans, right? Um, so yeah, those are the things that, that I would say to you. So, you know, at the end of the day, this business is not very easy, but with the right mindset, you can do it. Yeah, that's great. Um, so Annie, um, any advice to anyone who wants to go into photography or any creative field? Um, well, the, the things I would say is what are your reasons for, you know, starting, starting this? A lot of people, there, there's always two reasons or a combination of those or both. Is it that passion driven or money driven or both of them? So most of them, it could be passion you know, that drives you to, you know, to go in and, you know, depending on how much fire you have in you, you know, sure, it goes, it goes a long way, you know. If it's money, it carries you, you know, a certain amount of them. So if it's a combination of both, it's a great, it's a great thing because, you know, you have, you have passion, you know, to keep growing, you know, and you also want to make sure that, you know, returns and profit is, is made up to you. So, my advice to anybody creatively is, you know, build yourself up. That's, that's all. Our, our, our job, they really, nobody really asks. I've, I've done, I've left university after, uh, since 2011 and nobody till this day, I mean, sure, I'm, I'm now my own boss, but nobody to this day asks, where's your certificate, you know. Every time you know this is what can you do. So, it's like I said before, make sure you have everything together. Do the groundwork, learn, learn, build up portfolio. If you go back in the years, you personally will see the growth. If there's no growth, you know, you have to ask yourself what you're doing, you know, if this is the right, you know, profession for you. So that has to be it. Also, my word for people, you know, I want to make this, you know, a business or whatever is, you know, make make sure it's sustainable. People like I, I am one, if not for Lagos, I am really I'm re, I'm really a lazy person. You know, I I'm really laid back. Before you tell me to move, it's very hard. This lockdown, the only thing that changed from my life was that money stopped coming. If not, I'm always in my room. You know, so that's so I'm very lazy. So 
you know, make sure that anything you do, you can continue to sustain it. Every decision you make, you can't just, you know, up and, you know, with setting Vim, you know, how long will that Vim, you know, go on for? You know, make sure that, look forward, I'm like, sure, you know, I can continue. I see myself doing this, you know, for a while. You know, make sure that's there because if it's not there, it's going to die down at some at a certain point in time. I didn't come. I mean, at some point, sure, it was the money that kept me in. But you know, as I started working on you know pictures and stuff, I was enjoying it, especially because I have background. I was enjoying every bit on it, and I kept doing it, whether money was coming or not. I kept doing it and kept getting better. Then you know, something positive came out of it. So you know, you have to find what's sustainable for you. Build portfolio up. You know. And still, whatever, wherever you are, whatever you think you are, still try to get better. All right. Um, so um, this this skill base has been brought to you by Piggyverse, and um, um, I would like to thank everybody that that has um, has been watching us live. And um, this video, this whole session, will be uploaded to YouTube, so we can even reach more people. And um, I think there is something, um, you know, I think Annie has something for us before, before, before we go, something for Piggyverse users. Annie, what is, what is it, Pim? All right. So um, if you're a Piggyverse user, you know, I'm going to tell your people, I have something special, you know, in partnership with Piggyverse for December. I have something special. I have a partnership coming with them for, you know, my packages for my photo shoots. So if you want more information, Watch out on my pages, watch out on Piggyverse pages, and we're going to come to you live. It's, it's a special package. I'm sure you All want right. it. Too. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Annie. Uh, thank you very much, every, um, um, all our speakers. Um, um, Molagoke, thank you very much for, for spending time with us. For me, George, thanks a lot for coming and, um, and sharing um, some knowledge with us. Um, so we've come to the end of our program today. And um, um, and once again, thanks to everyone for for staying. You know, this went on longer than than I actually planned for. Um, so until next time, guys. Um, bye.